Journey Church, if we've not met, my name is Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. You know, we're in this series on family and marriage, and I really believe there's something in it for everyone. You know, church families matter too. Can I get an amen to that one? Church families matter. It's an extended family. In fact, I'll catch Will. Will, I noticed from back there, you are wearing the original Journey Church shirt. I don't know where you found that in your closet. I don't know how you still fit in it, brother, because I know I, I know I wouldn't fit in my original shirt from back then. But, you know, even last night, he and I were reminiscing. I found some old pictures, shot him a picture of a, a baptism that we probably did like 10 years ago. He was standing there next to me. We had the blessing and opportunity of baptizing people into God's very own family. And that's really what this series is about. We're talking about our second priority, which is family and marriage and things of that nature. But it doesn't matter if you're single here, um, if you are divorced here. I think there's something that we could all learn from God's plan and ordination for what marriage is supposed to be, right? It's an important institution right from the book of Genesis in the very first chapters, right? God's talking about this institution that man cannot redefine what God ordained. Can I get an amen, right? So we're talking about something incredibly important. I hope you find some real beauty in it today. Father, as we dive into your word, as we examine your heart on the subject that we're about to talk about today, Man, my heart does go to the families in Israel and Palestine, the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters who have lost someone in these past couple of days. Lord God, no matter the cause, no matter the background, no matter the issues, Lord, it does boil down to families that are hurting right now. And Lord, we pray for them and we intercede for them. Father, as we examine this subject, would you touch our own hearts and give us a new understanding and wisdom and discernment on it. If there are people who walked in this door today and maybe they're on their last leg seemingly with a relationship with some issues that are going on in their family, I pray this message would give them hope that could only come from you. We praise you and give you glory today in Jesus name and everybody says amen. amen. So Pastor Adam entitled this message series second priority meaning that there must be a first, right? And uh, the life verse, so to speak, that he chose for this series is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It's one of my favorite verses um, in the Bible by far. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, you read the preceding verses and it talks about all the worries of the world that you might have, the fears that we have of providing for our families, the, you know, putting food on the table, how we might be clothed. And he says, if you'll put God first then all these things will be added unto you, that everything will be okay, right? How many of you need a little dose of that today? A little dose of that peace, a little dose of that comfort, a little lack of fear in your life and your relationships that you might have, be it work, be it family, be it other, right? If you'll put God first, that's the core element that has to be present for success in really any area of life. If you're absent that particular thing, all of life is going to be disrupted to a degree. So it's imperative that we live what I would call a God-first life. Again, whether you're single here, whether you're married here, whether you're divor divorced, whatever situation you find yourself in, God is to be preeminent in every area of your life. There's some deep things that we're actually talking about here when, with the subject material that we're at. And I think at times we might take some of those too lightly. When God gives this prescription in his word that if we would only follow, our lives would be so much better. One version of it, I forget which one, says, make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Pretty simple, right? We all say as believers that the kingdom of God is our primary concern, but... When we walk through our life and we really measure it up, is that the truth? I know for me it's not oftentimes, right? We all got issues, we all got challenges. But would we put it in that kind of context today? I'm gonna to be talking about the context of marriage and relationships and family with an overriding subject of what's called partnership today. The context, man. I've had the privilege of being a pastor for over 20 years, and during that time, I've had the blessing of performing hundreds of marriage ceremonies. 
Every couple approached that day as the best day in their life up to that point. In fact, some of you were kind enough to send in a few pictures of your wedding day, and we'd like to share a few of those journey moments as we get off to a start today. Many, many happy couples with beaming faces on those particular days. I had the privilege of doing a lot of those weddings, but not all of them. Like I wasn't at Elvis's parents' wedding, you know, not back then. But hey, I do have a shot of Mary Jo and I's wedding, I think, along with uh, maybe one of our kids that they might be able to put up here. That's not us. Oh, they're on the sides. Okay, there we go. There we go over there. So that picture over there, Molly and Tyler got married and they banned all cell phones, but I brought out one so that I could get a selfie of the particular day there. But uh, that was Mary Jo and I when we were 18 years old. I mean, 18 years old back then getting married. So 80s, we looked like we could have been at Elvis's parents' wedding that particular day. If you compare those pictures, we were kind of cracking up about them. But, you know, no couple approaches that big day thinking that things could go sideways along the way, right? We're like, man, this is the best day. So today, in just a few minutes, I'm going to walk you through a bit of a marriage ceremony. But before we get there, there's a few other things to share. You know, I've had also the privilege of being married now for some 35 years. God is so good. It sounds glorious, right? It sounds like Mary Jo and I might have the perfect marriage and the perfect family. But let me tell you, we've had some issues along the way like everybody else. Can I get an amen, right? But this I know, we have a perfect God, right? We have a perfect God who's been there to to hold us all along the way. And marriage um, truly holds a unique and special place in the eyes of God. When it's manifested in a healthy way, it's really a reflection of the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we're in partnership with God, husband, wife, and Father God, right? It's a, it's a reflection of his nature. So it is no surprise that the devil continually goes after that, right? He wants to redefine what marriage is. He wants to redefine the very nature of our identity as a male or a female. He wants to go after that because he hates anything that is a reflection of the image of God, right? So that's why we see these battles out there even in our own generation. But I'm not going to go there today. I'm going to stay positive. We're going to talk about the things that we should be doing to create healthy marriages and families. So I thought one of the best ways that I might do that is to walk you through the modern day marriage ceremony that I do. So you're all invited to a wedding today and you didn't even know it, right? So welcome to this fictitious marriage that we're going to talk about here today. I'm going to walk you through some of the words that we're sharing. Now, I was reading a book on fathers and parenting um, in preparation for this message and how we partner with God in that. And I couldn't help but think about, man, all these subjects that I'm talking about, they actually do appear in the marriage ceremony template that I generally use. It's a powerful thing. Family and friends. 
We've come here today at the invitation of the bride and the groom to share in the joy of their wedding. This is an outward celebration that is an expression of the love, devotion, and commitment that they have in their hearts for one another. The scriptures teach us that marriage should be honored by all, that God established and ordained marriage to be the highest and happiest form of human relationships, the foundation of the home, and the strength of society. All of those things are vitally important, are they not? They're a beautiful reflection of who God is and what his desire is for the kind of relationships that we would have in our life. It goes on to say, as I give this instruction to the bride and the groom, as you join your lives together today, you are making a covenant with one another and with God. The first word that I want to really stand out on is this word covenant, because I don't think we fully understand it. I know I didn't even fully understand the depths of it, and I continue to explore the nature of it. Covenant defined is a relationship between two partners who make a binding promise, a legal contract, so to speak, with each other and work together to reach a common goal, right? When you make a covenant with God, I guarantee you his side will come to pass 100%. That thing said, you're making a covenant with one another and with God. If that is true, then why do 50 plus percent of Christian marriages fail? Maybe we don't understand the nature of covenant. Maybe we don't understand the nature of what we're getting into when we enter into a sacred relationship like marriage. Today is a day that we could revisit that. It's a day that we could explore that. It's a day when we could say, hey, God, help me understand this, not just in the context of marriage, but what does a partnership, a covenant with you look like? Because let me tell you something, if you ever want to have a successful relationship, be it a family relationship, a business relationship, if God is not at the center of it, it is going to be all the more difficult, right? Right? It's going to be a challenge. God should be at the center, as we talked about earlier. Here's what I didn't fully realize, and doing some additional digging into Scripture, when you think of the word covenant, the Bible always talks about a sacrifice needing to be made in the context of a covenant, right? So if you think back to um, covenant, you think back to Abraham, right? So God makes a covenant with Abraham, as we're going to see here in a second. So Abraham goes and he, he believes God. He says, Lord, will, will you give me a son? He's getting old in age. It's not going to happen. God honors that portion of the covenant and actually gives him a son. And then God turns around and tells him, guess what? I want you to go sacrifice your son. Do you trust me? It's like, whoa, hold on a second. What, what does that mean here, God? He doesn't hesitate. I certainly would have. I don't know about you, right? He goes up there. He gets up there. He puts up the altar. He gets ready to lay his son out. He gets ready to kill his son on the altar in accordance with what what God's saying to him. God sends a scapegoat to come in, right? And he gives him a sacrifice so that he doesn't have to sacrifice his one and only son, a type and shadow of what is to come at a later date, right? So a sacrifice is needing to be made to affirm the covenant that was there. And this is the part that I didn't fully understand. In the old days, when a covenant was being made of that sort and a sacrifice was being made, they would actually cut the animal in two first, right? They would put the different parts of the different animals of the animal on two different sides. And you would walk through the center of that as a reminder that something had to die in order for this covenant to go into place. It's dying in your place, right? And one scripture that I always just breezed over, I didn't understand it, I didn't know it, Genesis 15, 7. It says, after the sun went down and darkness fell, Abraham saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. They were laid out in that way. So God made a covenant with Abraham that day and said, and it goes on to do it. God himself walked through the center of that sacrifice to affirm the covenant with Abraham. Later, he would do the very same thing with his son, right? 
When you get married, you are walking through that sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, a great chasm between heaven and hell that was fulfilled by the cross. You're walking through the center of that sacrifice. Don't even get to marriage yet for a moment. When you get saved, you're doing the very same thing. You're dying unto yourself. Derek Prince writes it in this way. What does it mean to pass through the two pieces of the sacrifice? That death was my death. From now on, I die to myself and live for the one with whom I am in covenant. That's where it starts to get deep, right? So when you bring that into your own relationship with God and then later into your relationship with the other person, that's the depths of what we're beginning to talk about. It's a type and shadow of what God would do when he sent his one and only son Jesus to die in our place for our sins so that we could become part of his family, right? God died on a cross. He really died that you might have life, that you might be a part of his family. And in turn, it scripture says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives within me in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he died in your place for your sins, but you die to yourself. Your life is no longer your own. You are now a member of God's family. You are a member of the King of Kings family. Do we get that? That's an incredible thing. He became the sacrifice. It is no longer I that live. My wants, my desires, my needs. God honors those. He loves those, but they need to be in alignment with his will. That's why we go back to Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything will fall into alignment. Your life is not your own. But guess what? When two people get married, two sinners say, I do. (laughs) Selfishness is there. Challenges are there. It extends not only into marriage, but business relationships, other things that you might think about. You have sinners that gather together and we're bringing all of our past, all of our history, all of our challenges, and we don't often think about it in the context of needing to die to ourselves in order to make that relationship successful. So why do most marriages fail? We don't die to ourselves. It's me, my wants, my needs, my desires. You haven't satisfied them, so I fell out of love with you. And the fights ensue and the challenges ensue. What are most of them over? If you boil it down, most of it ends up being selfishness, right? Some form of it when you get down to the root of it. But Bible's telling us here that we need to die to ourselves. So guess what? This covenant stuff is not to be taken lightly. If you think you're going to be doing that, don't get married. If you want to stay selfish, stay selfish on your own. But if you saved, you don't even have that right no more. Because you've died unto yourself to live for Christ from that moment forward. Amen? Amen? So when we make that covenant with God and with one another, we're passing through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. After speaking about covenant, I always share about how God has to be the foundation if they want their marriage to be successful. That the purpose of their marriage is to become one in him and thus be a beautiful reflection of the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then I begin to introduce the concept of oneness from Genesis chapter 2. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. The Proverbs say, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And I always try to say that in a funny way, like look at the husband. And then they're like, oh man, this is right. You're, this is awesome. Dude, you got lucky, man. I can't believe, Will, I can't believe she married you. I mean, like, I mean, I just can't believe this. I'm just picking on you because you're in the front row, but it's all good. <laughs> all of us would, amen, with our wives. Thank you, Jesus. As a pastor, it's great to see how God can lead two people together who share a common life goal and vision for life. As your lives are blended together in one, God will lead you to places of excitement, fulfillment, and destiny that you could have not ever experienced alone. 
You know, I recently had a friend who sadly got a divorce. And I now see him like traveling all over the world by himself. See him in all these exotic places. I'm like, how miserable must that be at this stage? Like, I would not want to experience those things without Mary Jo. I wouldn't want to do that, right? I mean, like, how, like he's living the bachelor life at that age after being married and all that. I don't know what happened in their relationship, but at that stage, that's not, not a good thing, right? That, that's not good. It, it's sad. Like, there's things that God gives us that come out of those contexts, and, you know, what a beautiful thing it is when God allows us to have that kind of a relationship and be there with a spouse to be alongside of us and, and see things that we never would have been able to do on our own. Church, we were created for community. Even if you're single here, if you're divorced here, you're not meant to be alone. You're meant to do life with others. You're meant to hang out in small groups. You're meant to have friends. You're meant to be an expression of the kingdom of God in your everyday life, through your everyday relationships, wherever you find yourself. You're not meant to live in solitary confinement, right? You're meant to live life with other people. Hallelujah, Jesus. Genesis 2.24 Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We are to leave and we are to cleave and begin to become one. See, I was of a single mom growing up, right? But I'm not allowed to be a mama's boy no more. You can still love your mama, but you can't be a mama's boy no more, right? You're meant to go on with that other person moving forward from that day forward. See, and when, you, and, and when you consider sexual relationships as part of that, it gets even deeper because whenever two people get together, they do become one. So that's why God does not want you to have sex out of the context of marriage because every sexual partner that you have, you take a piece of them with you into whatever future relationships you have and that's generally not a healthy thing, right? He doesn't want that to be part of your life or part of that relationship, nor does he want you to go out when you are married and do adulterous things, right? Because the two are one, and then you're violating that oneness in that relationship. And yes, porn and other things like that are equally as bad. That's a form of adultery too. If you're trapped in that and you're in this place today, you need help. You need to cry out to God. That means something's interfering and getting in the way of your relationship with God and with your spouse, especially if you're married. You made a covenant with God and with your spouse to not do that junk. You said, I am his and I am hers forevermore. Don't allow that stuff into your life. If you're battling that stronghold, let's pray that God would break that addiction this very day that you would get over it, that you would be able to move forward in power and restore your relationship to the place where it's supposed to be. We are to leave and we are to cleave. I say we must commit to being one in every area of life, spirit, soul, and body. So how do we do that? By ministering and serving one another. We help each other's dreams come true as you lift each other up with love and encouragement. Some of you love to fight with your spouse. Stop it. Volatile relationships are not healthy in the long run typically, right? It's not about fighting. It's about complimenting. It's about love. It's about encouragement. It's about lifting up. It's about being there for one another. As you pursue God and his love together, your lives will be called one, become one. We are called not only to serve one another, but to serve God with each other. Do you get that? You're called to serve God. You're called to have a ministry, every one of you. Your ministry is not to come and sit here on Sunday morning and listen to me or Adam or others preach and teach. You're supposed to have a ministry. You're supposed to get outside the walls of the church and do stuff and inside the walls of the church and do stuff. You're not called to sit there and ingest and ingest and ingest and ingest. You'll never be all that you could be until you start serving, until you get in partnership with God. Philippians 1.5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. 
Partner with God. Be about his business. And guess what? Those things that you do that are not in alignment with him, he will begin to transform you from glory to glory to be a more accurate reflection of who he is. So this is a shameless plug. Sign up for a serve team. Get out there and do something. Serve with your spouse. Go serve. Hallelujah, Jesus. Your marriage must be built on Jesus and his word. I don't have this in my message for the weddings, but I might add add to it. All other grounds are sinking sand. Now to become one, we have to avoid selfishness. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility um, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. How many fights in your relationships at work, at home, could be avoided by that one simple verse and putting it into practice? Maybe let God catch you next time by the power of the Holy Spirit when you're getting ready to get into it. What's my motivation here? Am I being selfish? Lord, would you abolish that in my life? As we live out these things, your lives will be totally blended together as one In many modern day marriage ceremonies, we do some physical act to demonstrate that particular verse. Some do a sand ceremony where they pour the sands together and the two become one to demonstrate what that that is. Others do the blessings of the hands in a modern day context. If you haven't seen that one, it's a beautiful beautiful um, ceremony. Uh, One of my favorites is the cord of three strands. It's built off of the verse Ecclesiastes 4.9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fail, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, who will withstand him? A threefold cord is not easily broken. So you think about it with a cord, right? You get two. We've done this as demonstrations up here before. You get one string and you pull it and it'll break super easy. You get two strings and you pull it, it'll still break fairly easy. But you put that third string in there and it becomes very hard to break. If your lives are blended together with God at the center, I am telling you, you have a strong cord that is not easily broken, right? (laughs) Keep God at the center of all of your relationships, not just your marriage relationships, but vitally important there. Part four, the exchange of the rings. May I have the ring, please? Take the bride's ring, take the groom's ring. And I say, the ring of gold shows great value, unending love, and commitment. Funny story. You might look at me and say, Eric, where's your ring? I weighed 155 pounds when we got married. It don't fit no more right now. So we were actually at the jewelry store a few days ago looking to see if we could get one expanded or done. So when you get old together, sometimes you put on a little weight. Come on, Jesus. And uh, sometimes you need to get your ring refitted, right? So (laughs) I tried those rubber ones for a little while, but they seem to break, even the best of them. So it's time to get another ring. You exchange rings so that everyone will know the covenant that you made with one another. There's that word again. The vows. Groom, as you face your bride, place the ring on her finger and repeat after me. I take thee to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness or in health, to love and cherish until death do us part according to God's holy ordinance. The bride repeats it. So how does this look in real life? How does it play out after 35 years of marriage? What does that look like along the way? You know, when Mary Jo and I got married, we were not really believers at all, right? We actually lied to the priest. He didn't know that we were pregnant. We went there so that we could get married in the church. Kind of don't know why we even wanted to get married in the church, but maybe God had some plans later. So we walked up there and said all the words just like this, and we were lying to him, and she was already pregnant. Come on, Jesus. It's my fault. (laughs) But thanks be to God, he had other plans along the way, right? God ended up saving us age 22, and shortly thereafter, our church taught on biblical marriage. 
nothing wrong with my parents. They did the best job that they could in trying to share with us, but they were not believers at the time, right? And they didn't, um, you know, tell us the certain things about the ways that we should live or what marriage might look like. My mom was a single mom for a long time. And uh, thankfully, I had Dan, who's still in my life after all these years. She became my dad, and I call him dad and met him at age five, and he's been there all along my life for me. But um, we didn't know what biblical marriage looked like. You know, it was an amazing thing that we got in and within a few months, they were actually having a marriage ceremony at our church and it was called um, Building a Rock Solid Marriage, right? So we ended up going to that. Somebody actually gave us tickets to it. We were able to go to it and show up and we began exploring what a biblical marriage looked like. You know, we'd already been married for about five years at that particular point, but we didn't know any of these things. So it was a real blessing that we got to, to go there. And then we became part of a marriage small group, much like the ones that we have going on here right now. Um, I found it a little bit funny because uh, the, the marriage series and the book that we're going through right now um, is a variation of the rock solid marriage by, by there. Um, the new one is, uh, I forget, what is it called? Rob, do you know what it's called? Marriage on the rock. There you go. See, so play on words. When you get old, it turns into marriage on the rock instead of a rock solid marriage, right? And when we started, we actually led the young married couples group. Now we're in the young at heart. Come on, Jesus, right? (laughs) But that's part of how life is supposed to go as you go along the way. (laughs) I think you guys had a birthday recently or something. So uh, you're getting there, Rob. We love you too. (laughs) Hallelujah. But a couple things I've seen, just tips along the way in in years of pastoring, um, the people that need to be in a marriage group don't go to a marriage group. The people that are generally have stronger marriages are the people that you find in those groups. So if I had a tip for you, if you're struggling, get your butt in a marriage group, right? Seriously, right? Um, Start to explore, start to read, go pick up a book on marriage, like the ones that we're reading. You know, most of us were not taught in our homes what it meant to be a husband or a wife. You know, many of us come from fractured homes and divorced homes and challenged homes. Um, There's nothing wrong with learning and growing along the way. You know, Mary Jo and I had the the lucky benefit of gaining that at age 22, but you could start right now. You don't have to wait. Wherever you find yourself, continue to learn, continue to grow. She gave me a book recently, the one that I quoted earlier on Derek Prince on, on being a father. I'm like, I'm done with that particular part of my job, I thought. But I get to read that with the next generation, right? You got to continually learn, continually grow, make it a lifelong process where you learn how to better yourself in whatever areas you might find yourself weak, right? It says to have and to hold from this day forward, right? For better or for worse. How many of y'all like the better part? What about when you're 20 something years old and your husband's addicted to cocaine and alcohol? and challenges and fights and issues and lies to you because he's an addict, those are not the best of times. Those are some of the worst of times, right? But God has a way of helping us navigate through it. Or how many of you are in here and you've survived your kids being through the teenage years? Hallelujah, Jesus. You're still alive. You're still here, right? But not only that, our our, our kids, like I told you, we didn't have a perfect marriage and a perfect family along the way. We still struggle. We still have issues. Give you some, here's a, here's a good example. I was preaching on stage, right? So my, my one daughter knew this. She's not here, so I can share about it right now. But uh, so they knew I would be on stage and I couldn't be anywhere. So they would go steal money from my wallet and then she'd go steal the car and take it and drive around and go like buy stuff for her friends while I was at church because she knew I couldn't catch her. We had alarms back then because we had to keep the kids in, not worried about somebody coming in and stealing from the outside. Right? We needed to know if they were trying to sneak out. So then what they do? They doctored the alarm. They wouldn't learn how to doctor the alarm so they could still sneak out the house. Some of our children have thankfully struggled with addiction and overcome addiction. Um, some of them struggled in relationships and now are in relationships where they're growing and learning and, and continuing to build upon those, right? We, we, none of us have perfect families. Do you get that? None of us have perfect families. Your pastor doesn't have a perfect family. None of us have perfect families. We can all learn. We can all grow. There's no shame in that as long as you're continuing to try to point yourself towards Jesus. We've suffered a lot throughout the course of our years, attacks from our enemies and so on. I could go on. For richer or for poorer, 
One funny story, I didn't tell my wife I was going to share this because I know she's going to kill me. <laughs> so we're young. Mary Jo had this beautiful little truck growing up. So beautiful little truck, right? So it comes time to finally meet the parents, right? Come over to the house for the first time. My whole family's there. I don't remember exactly if it was Thanksgiving or what the date was, but uh, Mary Jo's coming over to meet the family for the first time. So she's a little bit late. So we're starting to get worried about her, but we didn't have cell phones and stuff like that back then, y'all, right? So we couldn't call her and find out. So eventually Mary Jo pulls up and uh, I come outside to greet her and I'm like, oh, hi, Mary Jo. And the hood of her truck is in the back of her truck and the engine is out there all exposed, right? So she's driving there to meet us and the truck was really kind of a junky old truck and then boom, it blew off. She paid for it herself. Hallelujah, Jesus. So me being young and naive, I think this is pretty funny. So, hey, family, come on, check this out. Look, her hood blew off of the thing. So poor Mary Jo showing up, completely embarrassed. The hood blows off of her truck. She's showing up to meet the family for the first time. Remember richer for poorer stuff here? Come on, Jesus, right? That's how she met the family. And why she stayed with me after that, I'll never know, right? But uh, so every family's got issues. We all got challenges. And thank God we still have stories after all of these years, right? We got married at 18. I mean, chicken pot pie was high on the menu. Come on, Jesus, right? We didn't even know how to cook, you know? I mean, like, but God is good. In sickness or in health, you know, we had many years where we, we lived very healthily and, you know, almost two years ago, I, I about died, people, you know, it was not good. I got to see a different side of my wife and it was a strange thing. You know, I react sometimes in very different ways. The way that I'm wired is, is bad at times, you know, and, and one of the things that I did strange was I didn't want anybody to see me in that state. I didn't. And the nurses interpreted that in kind of a bad way and told her they didn't want her there. He doesn't want you there. That was like the furthest thing from the truth, you know. Who wouldn't want their wife by their side while they're laying there in the bed half dead, you know. But in sickness or in health, that woman would stay up with me in the middle of the night and I couldn't get up. And she would take care of me and she was there for me. In sickness or in health, for richer or for poorer. To love and to cherish until death do us part. One day, one of us is going to get called home first. I don't know who that'll be. But I can tell you this, I will be there by her side. She'll be there by my side. I know that, I know that, I know that with all assurance that if we put God first, if we love one another, he will help us overcome even the biggest of challenges because I tell you, we've been through a number of them. As I've shared, I could go on and on and on with the different stories of the pains that we've been through in our life. This is how God's called it to play out for us. And I hope the same for you. If you're here today and you're struggling in your family, man, I pray God shows up right now, this very moment. Maybe some of you walked in here and you were considering divorce. May that be the furthest thing from your mind. You can overcome it. There were moments in our marriage where Mary just said, I want him to get better so that the kids have a good place to go on the weekend. God turned all that around for us and he could do it for you. If you have a son or a daughter who's struggling with addiction or mental illness or you name it, there's hope. There's hope. God can help you overcome. God can help you endure. If you have a wayward son or daughter, he could bring them back. Don't give up. Maybe your family and your relationship is fractured right now. There's elements of our family that remain fractured at this very moment that we're still standing in agreement for, still praying for, knowing that one day God will bring restoration in that area. Don't give up stick together, keep focusing on him. And man, let me tell you, he's going to give you that life of your dreams. Those who God has put together, let no man put asunder. Some of the favorite parts, 
I do pronounce to you today, this day, husband and wife, and everybody's favorite part, you may kiss the bride, right? And you got, if you're the pastor, you got to run out at that moment. I like run off to the side because it's all about them. Family and friends, it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Jaffe and their new relationship as husband and wife and best friends for life. I do one other thing, and some people don't like that part of it, but after the couple walks away, I'll often say, you know, troubles will come. It's a guarantee in the Bible. It says, in this life, you shall have trouble, right? So what happens when those that are in our family relationships or friend relationships um, have that trouble moment? Because it's going to come at some point. Are we going to point them back towards God, towards each other? Or are we going to say, oh, that man, I told you, you should have never got with him. I knew this was going to happen. Go ahead and get a divorce. No, you can't be saying stuff like that. That we need to support them and help one another. So I'd ask you to rise with me and just bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going.